Good morning. And uh, first of all, let me greet the online worshiping community. Thank you for allowing us to come into your homes and your personal worship spaces this morning and, and spend an hour of worship with you. Uh, however you are, your weekend is progressing. Hope that uh, this time together is a good part of the rest of your weekend. And to those in the, in the, in the sanctuary, it's good to see all of you, and, and I hope that you uh, feel good being back in this space as well. If this is your first time, uh, let me go over a couple of things just about the, the worship uh, service because we're doing things differently now. First of all, we are taking communion with these individual serving uh, kits. We are not passing the trays uh, for the foreseeable future. So you should have received one of these when you came in. If this is your first time using them, there are two seals. The top seal releases the bread, the bottom one, the cup. They may be a little tricky. So uh, for the first next, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, you want to kind of get that top seal opened. Uh, that way you'll be ready when it's time for communion. Uh, thank you for wearing masks when you came into the building. That's what we're doing. Uh, the rule of thumb is when you're on your feet, uh, we ask that you have a mask on, and then once you're seated in your worship space there, uh, then you feel, feel free to take your mask off. But thank you for that. Um, we are not encouraging congregational singing for the foreseeable future, but uh, Christian is going to lead our singing. And uh, if you want to hum along, go ahead. Uh, and also, we're not serving coffee or any kind of refreshments after worship. Uh, we know that a big part of uh, coming together on Sunday is fellowship. And so we're just, it's a beautiful day outside, so as long as we have great weather, we're just going to encourage people to, uh, once you're dismissed by the ushers, um, then to, uh, to, to do your, your visiting outside. But uh, that's been working well for us at, at the 1030 service, and uh, we trust that that will be uh, good for the 8 o'clock service as well. So it's good to see you all. And uh, another big part of our, our um, worshiping Sunday is greeting. So uh, you want to kind of swivel in your pew and say hi to the folks around you. Feel free. Greeting. Good morning, everyone. Well done. And uh, at this time, just invite you to be in a spirit of worship as Christian uh, sings our opening hymn, number 91. Please stand if you are able and join me in our responsive reading. Uh, this morning we will be doing a call and response 
So after I, after I say my line, you will follow with, we are called to follow Jesus. We are called to move among the people. We are called to follow Jesus. Called to feel with them. We are called to follow Jesus. Called to care for them. We are called to follow Jesus. Called to touch them and be touched by them. Called to be the children of God. We are called to follow Jesus. Will you pray with me? Lord, we ask you that you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your wisdom. Open our spirits so that we may know your leading and your guidance. And open our hearts so that we may receive your love. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. children's message so if there are any children at home watching if you want to scoot a little bit closer and maybe listen up a little bit harder right now now would be a great time so uh, this week most of us are getting ready to go back to school and there's there's one thing we know for sure this year is gonna look and feel a little bit different right now we all have our usual our usual preschool or when, when we get ready for school we feel excited or scared or nervous and, and again, this, this year, it's gonna feel, feel a little bit different. Some of us are able to go back to school and be in our classrooms with some of our friends and our teachers. And some of us are gonna be at home working on our computers and our iPads with the remote learning. So again, it's, 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 gonna, it's gonna be different. And it's gonna be, sometimes you're not gonna be able to understand everything that's going on. If we are at school, we're gonna have to do a few things a little bit different, kind of mess up, with our, mess up our routines. We won't get to do all the, all the things at lunch or recess or, or PE or music or some of those. Might, might feel a little bit different. And again, it, it's okay if we feel a little, a little scared or a little nervous or we don't really understand what's going on. But there's one thing that we need to remember. That during, during this year, we need to really, really, really try to focus on our patience. We need to be patient with our teachers with our classmates, with our parents, with our brothers and sisters, and with ourselves, because everyone's in the same boat. Everyone is feeling what you're feeling, if you're nervous, or if you're anxious, or if you're excited. Everyone's having those feelings as well. So as we get ready to start this school year, whatever that's gonna look like for you, I just want us to really focus on staying patient and always working hard. Does that sound good? All right, so if you would, Fold your hands, bow your head with me, and repeat after me. Dear God, help us to always be patient with our teachers, our family, and ourselves. Amen.
any time, at any time, prayer requests to reminder to everyone in the sanctuary that you can let the church know, let any of the pastors know, and we will put you on our prayer list, share your prayer concern with the elders and the prayer team as you would give us direction to do that. And similarly, for you watching online, even though we may be separated physically, uh, we don't want to be separated spiritually. And so if you have prayer requests, you can email them to central at CCC Disciples or to any of the pastors. The pastor's emails are on the screen right now, and you can uh, address any of us personally, and we will follow up with you and um, offer the pastoral care that we're able to do even if uh, there's some remote action involved. But uh, let's be in a spirit of prayer together as we uh, come before the Lord this morning. Almighty God, you are so great and majestic and powerful that no tongue on earth could ever accurately tell of your wondrous nature. You are so miraculous, able to calm storms which seem utterly overwhelming to us, that we find ourselves standing in amazement as the disciples did before Jesus, asking in wonder, who are you that you can do such things? And yet you are also with us. You emptied yourself and came down to inhabit with your spirit every aspect of creation, every person in creation. You are the one who walks with us as a shepherd with his sheep. You are one who hears our cries as a mother senses the fears of her children. You are one who finds us in our wildernesses and acts to save us through them. And so it is to you that we turn today, seeking to be redeemed from our wildernesses of doubt, confusion, fear, stress, and anxiety. We understand, O oh God, that to be rescued is not to be saved from our obstacles always, for it is often the very obstacles we face that you use to shape us into the people we are meant to be. But we do pray for patience and courage as we face those obstacles. And we pray for the spiritual understanding that you are with us and that we never face any of them alone. Today, we pray a special prayer of blessing and protection over all who are returning to school this month, whether in person or virtually, whether they be teachers, students, staff, or parents, whether it means traveling to college or starting a new school or grade with a new set of teachers. We pray that in these most uncertain times that a spirit of peace and calm would rest upon all of us, our schools, our churches, our homes, so that we can reveal in our own words and actions to one another things that build each other up and helps each of us grow into our best and fullest potential. And we pray for everyone on our prayer list and all that we offer from the silence of our hearts. In the name of Christ, who is our great Redeemer and Rescuer. Amen. It is interesting that for as mighty and powerful and majestic and miraculous as Jesus' ministry was, that he often went out of his way to speak about the value of small things. He spoke about having faith the size of a, the size of a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds. He spoke of how giving a single cup of water to someone thirsty is an act worthy of the kingdom, and he spoke of the value of a woman, a widow, giving two copper coins to the treasury and how that was the most important gift of all. Now, when Jesus praised that widow for giving those two copper coins, I don't believe he was suggesting that pennies have more financial value in the kingdom than dollars or checks, but rather his focus was on the sincerity of our hearts 
and the intentionality of our actions. When we give out of gratitude for what we have and recognize God as our great benefactor, and when we give what we give thoughtfully and carefully, it really doesn't matter the financial value of our gift. For that action itself and the way we do it carries a spiritual value that can never be quantified or monetized. We at Central are grateful for every gift that we ever receive and more importantly we hope that each of us strives to, strives to give in a spiritually appropriate manner out of gratitude and with thoughtfulness and sincerity of hearts. If you have an offering that you would like to give today we are not again passing offering trays uh, through the sanctuary. There is instead a a brass bowl in the Friendship Center right outside the sanctuary doors and you're welcome to leave your gift there. If you are giving, uh, if you are watching online and if you are also in the sanctuary, you can give online and just by going to the website cccdisciples.org and then looking for the word give in the upper right hand corner of the home page. Very easy to follow the prompts from there. And we also have a text number. You can text 217-212-2173 and also follow easy steps to text to give. But however we receive gifts and in whatever fashion, we always lift them up to God. We ask God to bless, consecrate, and dedicate those gifts for holy purposes. Thanks be to God.
For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I If the wind goes where you send it, so will I If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I If the sun will fall, our praises still fall shy Then we'll sing again a hundred billion times I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, we are thankful that you are a God who never leaves the one behind. We come before you, great God, giving thanks that we can gather around your word. And as we do that now, I pray that the words of my mouth and all of our thoughts and prayers are pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today we begin a new sermon series that will carry us into the middle of September, so six weeks, including today. And the sermon series is is based on two simple words, and I'd like to spend today's time just introducing those words for us all. The first word is you, Y-O-U, you. And even though that's a little word, there's a lot of things we know about that word, Y-O-U. Grammatically speaking, we know that it's the second person, as opposed to first person, I, and third person, he, she, it. You is second person. And when we use second person language, there is automatically a sense of directness that is created that's not replicated with third person. So, for example, when we use third person language and communication, there's, there's always a degree of separation. There's always a triangle created when we use he, she, or it, third person. There's a level of, of something being removed, indirection, indirect. So, there, two legs or two points of a triangle, I and you, are speaking about he, she, or it over here when we use third-person language and a triangle is created. You know what that sounds like. Can you believe what he, she, or it did? (gasps) Perish the thought. 
we're talking about someone. There's a, there's a, a, a level of something being removed, right? When we use third person, two people are talking about someone. But when we use the second person, all of that's gone. And we have a straight line directness, just me and you. That's what you represents. The word you represents straight line communication, directness. And because it's direct, there's a sense that you represents personal. You is a word that wants to be personal. And we see that revealed in our scripture reading today from the Gospel of Matthew. It's a very short verse, a couple of verses. It's uh, the midpoint in Jesus' ministry. He has just fed 4,000 people with a few loaves of bread and a few fish. And now he pulls the disciples together in private and he asks them a question. And here's how the scripture sounds, Matthew 16, verses 13 through 16. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he said to the disciples, who do people say that I am? They said, some say John the Baptist, uh, others say Elijah, uh, still others uh, say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Simon said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So did you notice there's two questions that Jesus asked? The first question was a third person question. Who do they say that I am? Right? Who do people say that I am? And then the second question, they, the disciples give their answer, and then he, then he shifts to second person. Okay, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And notice that all of this other stuff is gone. The focus narrows to this straight line. What about you? That's what you represents. It's personal. It's not about what he sh thinks or they, their opinion is. It's not about this stuff out there. It's about what's inside of you, what you think, what you feel, what your experiences are. That's what the word you represents. It doesn't allow us to hide behind something out there, but that's okay. Because the word you, in addition to being direct and personal, you is a word that wants to be close. It wants to have a, a closeness and a connection. I learned that in a, in a very up-close and personal way when I lived in Germany for three years, or the better part of three years, and I spoke nothing but German. Now, I was in Eastern Germany, which was formerly communist, and, and the, the one benefit of that linguistically was all of the West Germans after World War II learned English, and the East Germans learned Russian <laughs> and no English, so they couldn't speak English, which forced me to, to learn German really well if I was going to survive. But the German language has two words for you, an informal and a formal. And the words are spelled differently, and the verbs are conjugated differently, so you really have to figure out what you're doing. And the rules of social etiquette say that you always start with the formal, especially when you're going to the store and doing business with somebody, or if, if someone's older than you, that's the proper thing to do. Start with the formal, and you use the informal you when you're talking to your peers. You're talking to your friends, you're talking to the people that you have breakfast with after worship on Sunday morning. Then you use the informal language. Now, if somebody at the store that you're working with uh, or older than you says, you know what, Michael, let's dispense with the formality and let's use the informal you. It always has to be the older person speaking to the younger person. Then, then that's their way of saying, look, let's, let's just be on the same level. We're peers now. We're friends. That makes sense? Like the formal you has a distance between the two people. But, but when we use the informal, we eliminate that distance and we say, we're going to be on the same level here. Makes sense? Well, I share that with you because when the Germans pray, when they pray to God and they talk to God, they use the informal you. 
And I was shocked at first. Really? I mean, if anybody deserves formality and, and, and politeness, it's the heavenly creator, right? I mean, we can't talk to God less formally than we talk to the barista ordering our coffee on, uh, uh, at the bakery in the morning. But the people taught me that this is built into the fabric of the culture using the language it's embedded in the practice and the way that they speak that shows that god is not uh, to be approached with fear as though we have to protect this distance but that god coming down in 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 human form and inhabiting jesus and all of creation is a way of saying god wants to be on our level and God wants to be approached as a peer, as a friend. That's what you represent, this closeness, this connection. I believe that's what the Apostle Paul meant when he said in, uh, in his letter to the Galatians, in chapter 4, he said, he said, through faith, we are members of God's holy family as though through adoption doesn't matter who our earthly parents are all of us are spiritually adopted through the spirit into God's holy family and because of that we are able to call God Abba or sometimes we say Abba now that word Abba or Abba is the informal way of saying father in other words it's like saying dad Think about that word, dad or mom. Isn't that a word that just breeds closeness? I mean, my children don't call me Mr. Karunas, right? They, they reserve that title for, for you and other dads that they, with whom they don't have a connection. But that word dad is, is, is close. That's what the word you represents, direct straight line, personal, close connection. And there's one other thing that we know about that word you. It can be used to refer to something in the singular or the plural, can it? We can say you, we can be talking to one person or we can be talking to many as in you all. Now when we use the word uh, singularly, you, it represents all the things we talked about, straight line communication, close personal connection. But when we use it to refer to a group, it also means community and togetherness and coming together. Now the problem that we have in English is that we don't spell that word differently. So sometimes when we read, especially when we read the Bible, we don't always know right away if the you is meant to speak to one person or it's meant to speak to many people. Here's the good news though. The original language of the New Testament, Greek, does have two words. So we know exactly when Jesus speaks if he's speaking to one or many. So that means that when Jesus said, for example, in Luke 17, verse 21, he said, the kingdom of God is within you. He was using the plural form of you. As if to say that the kingdom of God is not a private possession. It's not found in us solely individually, but rather it's found in our togetherness and in all of our coming together as the community of believers. Or that when Jesus said uh, in John 14, 13, these famous words, whatever you ask for in my name, it will be given to you. Heard that before? Again, the plural form is used as if to say that prayer is not just about individuals asking for, for what blesses the individual, but there's also a, a community sense to that. It's the community learning to come together and ask in faith for what is a blessing to the community as a whole. That's the power of you. So you represents close, direct, personal connection and, and building up our togetherness in the process. That's the first word of the sermon series, you. And the second word, another short word, R, A-R-E, A-R-E, you are. And there's one very important thing we know about the word are, same thing. It's present tense, isn't it? It's a verb. It's the present, it's not the past, were, and it's not the future, will be. 
And that tells us right away that the word are is focused on the here and now. It doesn't care about yesterday. It doesn't care about where you were yesterday or what mistakes you made yesterday or the things that you might regret about your past. It also isn't overly focused on the future. It understands that tomorrow will come on its own, whether we worry about it or not. I think that's important for us to hear, all of us. David Martin talked about patience for the children's message today. As I was finishing up vacation, I read this book by Richard Rohr called uh, The Universal Christ. And part of in, in it, he mentioned how hard it is for us human beings to focus on the present moment. And he cited this study. He said the average human being spends 15 times as much energy reliving yesterday or worrying about tomorrow than it does, than they do a, a focusing on the present moment. You follow that? There's a little bit of a mouthful. We, in other words, we spend, as individuals, we spend far more time replaying yesterday's events, wishing that we would have said something differently, wondering if we'd changed something, and we spend far more time worrying about what may or may not happen tomorrow than we, than we do focusing on the present. David Williams and I were at a uh, men's Bible study this past Thursday afternoon, and the conversation was about miracles. And one of the men said, uh, you know, it could be that there are miracles happening all around us. We just don't notice them. And I think, yeah, because we're spending all our time worrying about yesterday and imagining tomorrow's problems. But that's the power of R. It reminds us of the, 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 the importance of this present moment, the here and the now that this matters. So that's our sermon series. It's going to focus on those two words, you and are. Now, sadly, when we put those words together in the world today, they can be used really negatively, can't they? They can use, be used to belittle people. They can be used to, as part of name calling, Think about how many times we read uh, in social media comments or, uh, or we hear phrases like, you are crazy, you are stupid, you are dumb, you are misguided, you are wrong, you are a fill in the blank here with your favorite label. We hear those sadly, don't we? And the, the reality when you are, when those words are used in that way, it will always create distance. It always creates separation and division. Think about that. If someone says to you, you are dumb, foolish, stupid, and crazy, are you going to want to spend more or less time with them? You know, that's the true social distancing technique. Seriously, we don't need tape on the floor to socially distance. We just need to teach one another to say you are negative phrases and we'll be sure to clear the room because it does create division and distance and separation. The saddest thing of all is that when we use you are in those negative ways like that, what we're really communicating to someone is you are not like me. You are beneath me. And I can't even listen to you. Here's the good news, though. This is the church of good news. And the good news is that when Jesus uses those words, you are, he uses them to show that we are like him. And that we are on this. This is not about superiority and inferiority. And it's not about being above and beneath. Jesus uses those words to show us that we are like him and that he is like us and we are on the same level. Do you know that the night before Jesus died in the upper room, John 15, 15, after the disciples had the Last Supper, literally moments, minutes, maybe an hour before he was arrested, Jesus said these words to his, his disciples. He said, I call you servants no longer. Instead, I call you friends you are my friend. No distance. We're on the same level. So over these next five weeks, we are going to look at five phrases 
from Scripture that begin with the words, you are, and we will see that they are used to, in a way to inspire us individually by showing that, that they are used to, to show that, that God in Christ wants a close, direct, personal connection, and they're meant to inspire us collectively because every time we see that word you, it will be plural. So we will hear Jesus say, you all are the light of the world, and you all are a royal priesthood, and you, the kingdom of God is among all of you. And there will be a, a daily Bible assignment too. Um, some of you have, have really responded to this well, and I hope that everybody gives us a, gives us a try. For the next five weeks, we are going to invite you, challenge you to read through the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to email out tonight. I've already printed in the visitor the first week's readings. It's about three verses to eight verses a day. That's it. But by the end of the time, you'll have read through the, the whole Sermon on the Mount. It's Jesus' first sermon, and it's where many of the you are phrases come from. But if, I'll email out a packet like this, and you can check off your progress as you go. So I hope that you're able to join us, whether that's virtually or in person or both. If you have to miss a Sunday, uh, you can always watch online. I hope that you're able to join us. This is our attempt over the next several weeks to turn to Scripture and, and seek from God a word of reason and a word of hope in our world that is too often plagued by chaos and division. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you are a God who uses words you are to connect with us, to lift us up, to strengthen not only our, our, us as individuals, but also our collective community. And we pray that we might be able to receive that and also reflect that and embody that message for the world in the ways that we live our lives. In your holy name we pray. Amen. And now as we uh, hear from Christians singing our our hymn of communion, uh, even though we have um, some social distance uh, regulations here, we are still uh, welcoming people to join the church, which is what we do at this time of the service. So if you are motivated to join the church today, either by confessing faith in Christ for the first time or transferring your membership to the church, please just come forward, put on your mask, I'll have mine on, and we'll uh, take care of everything right here at the front of the church. Otherwise, just invite you to enjoy the music and be in a spirit of reflection on this word that we've heard.
This meditation was shared with us by Jerry Munoz. The new normal, that is what we are calling our world today. That is our answer to explain all the upheaval, fear, and turmoil going on in the world today. As teachers prepare for a new school year with so much uncertainty and fear, they are hearing so much negativity. You are not wanting to work. You are not thinking about the needs of your students. You are not doing enough. And the list goes on and on. They commit so much of themselves their time and dedication to their students and face the uncertainty with grace and patience. But as we gather today in the house of God, remember that you are in the presence of the family of God and therefore you are with family today. In the very elements of communion, Christ is said to be present this is my body, this is my blood. We may not understand this, but we understand that it is true. You need not be in perfect mind and body to come to the Lord's table. Your hurts, fears, wants, needs, sins are no barrier to him. You are in the right place. You are with Christ. And we welcome everyone to join us for communion, whether you're a member of this church or not. It doesn't matter to what church you belong if you're watching online. We believe that this is Christ's table. We are simply those who are called to invite people to it. And as we come around this table, we remember that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And how in the same way he took a cup after supper, and when he given thanks, he gave it to them also and said, this cup is the new covenant shed for you in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins and your salvation. Drink of this, all of you, in remembrance of me. This prayer is shared by Connie Bordner. Will you pray with me? Lord, we come here as siblings, all different, but all one family through our brother, Jesus. Here there are no yous, only we. All the same in our oneness of spirit, all saved by grace, no one a greater or lesser creation. We come here praying for a new understanding of our kinship to every you we encounter. Through the emblems of body and blood laid before us, may we gain strength to let go of ego in order to embrace the image of love in every one of our siblings in Christ. We pray your blessings go with us. Amen. Amen. And if you'd like to get your emblems, communion elements ready, we will partake of the bread and cup in the traditional way that we do at this service. The bread which we break is our communion in the body of Christ. And together we say, and the cup of blessing for, for which, which we give, we give thanks, thanks is our, is communion, our communion in, in the, the blood, blood of Christ. Christ. Amen. And now as we go forth, our benediction will be our closing song here. Go in, go in peace.
the Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace for you. 